next fire comes along, and then it pops up and grows in what basically is the agricultural niche, um, the same niche that we grow most of our, our agricultural crops in, uh, but it's been doing it for the past four plus or million years. Um, and so the idea was by studying this particular native tobacco that comes up and forms these large monocultures after fires and goes through all the sorts of things that you that plants have to do when they grow in monocultures, um, uh, that we would have the opportunity to learn um, some major some tricks that these plants have uh, evolved in those for many years of living in that agriculture niche that we could maybe make our agricultural plants even logically smarter, more self-sufficient uh, than they really are. Um, um, the fuel station is located in Utah, as I, as I mentioned. If you fly over it on your way to Vegas, uh, um, which is the nearest airport, um, it looks like this. Um, and this is what we've been releasing there in terms of negotiating at Tenuata for the past 14 years. So last year we, we had uh, 43 different lines that were released, um, at a little bit under 3,500 plants. But we've also been doing some releases on some Latin Negro and some Petunia lines. And this is what we've been able to do in Germany. Um, uh, we were attacked twice, um, and then uh, various legislation made it basically impossible to do field releases anymore. And it certainly was uh, immoral for me to be training graduate students whose uh, research could be uh, disrupted um, by people who were breaking the law, but the law was not going to be enforced. Um, so um, that's why we sort of spend most of our time permanently jet lagged, uh, flying back and forth between. Uh, this is what uh, what a typical field plant looks like. This is a 2013 field plantation. Um, and what we basically do is use all the different organisms that occur in this habitat, whether they be fungi or birds or microbes or insects, to help us understand what the genes are that allow this particular plant in, uh, to exist in that habitat. So we're basically using the plant as a window into the ecosystem and the ecosystem as a way of, of understanding the function of the genes uh, in this particular plant. Genes, after all, are maintained or pseudogenized from the genome based on their effect on the winning fitness. And uh, if we're going to understand gene function, we're not going to be able to do it simply by just expressing proteins heterologously in the laboratory, looking at their biochemical function, because whether or not they're going to enhance an organism's Darwinian fitness depends on Darwinian fitness. And you don't measure Darwinian fitness in the laboratory or in a heterologous expression system. You measure it in planta or in the organism in, in, in the habitat that it actually works. So um, we're relatively unique in, in, in having a research program like this, and it's really thanks to the combinations of the North Park Society and Brigham Young University that allow us to put these two worlds that together. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you a story about this plant, a plant that harkens back to uh, what Professor Goodman was talking about with regard to Bt. Because about three million years ago, this plant evolved this biosynthetic pathway to produce a compound that many of us in the room might have had a good relationship with um, uh, uh, for a period of time, namely nicotine. And nicotine is an amazing anti, uh, an amazing insecticide. It's amazing uh, uh, protection against any herbivore because it poisons the very thing that makes a difference between herbivores and plants. Herbivores have muscles, they move. Those muscles are activated by an acetylcholine receptor. That acetylcholine receptor is poisoned by nicotine better than almost any other molecule around. And there is no acetylcholine receptor known on the planet resistant to nicotine, it's poison. So when this plant evolved this ability to fill up its tissues with this remarkable poison, it probably had the same sort of wonderful selective advantage that our crop plants that are protected by that compound right now um, as Professor Goodman was arguing, upwards of 70% of the corn crop is, is protected by, by various combinations of Bt toxin. Okay, now, as with any type of situation in ecology, uh, once you have a strong selective force, you select for counteradaptation. Fred Gould's work on it has shown that Bt toxin is, is you know, selecting for Bt resistance in lots of different insects, Protella, etc. Um, and uh, there was no difference, really, with in the case of Mucosia attenuata. There was a group of insects that had figured out how to eat uh, attenuata. And what I want to do is tell you very quickly what has happened to this plant as a consequence of these insects evolving resistance to uh, their main uh, 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 toxin, or their main metabolite that they produce. And I'm going to tell you, take you through a five-step layer that this plant has evolved to be able to deal with the fact that this caterpillar right here is able to eat nicotine with 
with uh, no consequences at all. It has got the world record on nicotine uh, resistance. It can uh, chew through six or seven lethal doses of nicotine for a human being per day, and it all starts right here on that, on that little edge right there. You can see if the lights were not as bright, you would see a little green slimy edge there as the caterpillar is chewing around. And that green slimy edge um, is uh, a, a situation where the caterpillar is introducing into the plant by accident spit. Um, it has to actually lubricate the places where it chews along. And that spit contains this group of compounds here. These are elicitors in spit. They're called fatty acid amino acid conjugates. They're just signals that the plant uses to say, hey, you're being eaten by uh, Manduca sexta, the resistant guy, the one that is going to, you know, has no sensitivity to your nicotine. And what happens in the plant is absolutely remarkable. There is a complete reconfiguration of the plant that involves these five layers. I'm just going to scream through very quickly. Just, just kind of catching the music. It's all published. Um, it's taken, uh, you know, 300 publications or so to, 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 to describe all this. Um, it involves a signaling cascade, which I'm not going to go into any of the details on. But um, uh, somebody's, uh, if you're interested in molecular biology, you might recognize some of the kinases and the like. Um, and all that signaling basically has to do with the process of the of the plant recognizing these. Um, uh, uh, these particular FACs, these spit factors, and the first thing that happens is the plant begins to produce a whole bunch of new metabolites. Plants are just marvelous at being able to make uh, uh, new secondary metabolites, and the plants produce a whole series of compounds that we are discovering are toxins. Um, and what's most interesting is that it completely turns down nicotine production. I explained why the plant does that in the end of this little cycle here. Uh, but it upregulates very dramatically a whole group of compounds that are terpenoids and phenolics and ditropin glycosides and various phenolic amines. Um, many of the structures were unknown until we started this process, as well as producing a whole bunch of things that are basically digestibility reducers, things that interfere with the reason why an insect eats a plant, which is to turn plant protein into insect protein. Uh, the great reason why you guys eat, why all heterotrophs eat, right? Um, and so these two strategies are all regulated by that signaling cascade by those particular spit factors. If you get lost, everything I'm telling you about is regulated by these spit factors, okay? And um, what we do is we use various sort of informatic approaches, ways of knitting transcriptomes, metabolomes together. Rich Dixon knows much more about this than I can do it much more articulately than I can. But we found all sorts of transcription factors and biosynthetic, uh, regulatory biosynthetic genes allow us to take out whole pathways. And so we can produce plants that are not making those particular compounds. Um, and I need a little help with the movie, thank you. And then we take those plants that are silenced in one particular pathway. Here's a group of plants that don't make 16 different types of uh, diterpene glycosides, and we simply just ask the ecosystem, why are those compounds there? The plants look perfectly normal in the greenhouse. They have no phenotype. Sometimes they get a little yield boost of silence in it, but the insect community usually tells us why. And in this case, as you can see, this is this is speeded up. It's not actual time. I'm done with the work on but this plant is getting ravished, um, and, and it just shows you how incredibly effective these particular diterpene glycosides are against, against that insect. But it turns out that, so these, these are, the step one and two are both things that are called direct defenses because the plant is protecting itself by changing its own chemistry and, and protecting itself directly. There's also a group of compounds or a type of responses that are called indirect defenses because they don't, the chemistry that it's changed has to do with a series of volatile compounds that are just like changing the body odor of the plant. The plant so it puts out this little Chanel number five and attracts the enemies. These are all the natural enemies of the insect. Um, now, just for all the politicians in the argument uh, in the room, um, I'm sure you realize that uh, this is the enemy of the plant, right? And these are the enemies of the insect, right? So the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And, and this is exactly what this plant is doing. It's simply just calling in the enemies of your enemies um, and clearing out herbivores. And this is uh, a beautifully regulated process. We've got transcription factors for it, and it wouldn't it be nice if we could bring this into our agricultural process uh, because we could use natural enemies much more effectively to control pest problems, um, but it really requires the ability to use transcription. So this is so how it looks. Uh, a caterpillar will chew um, on, a, uh, on a leaf. 
plant begins to release this compound called transalpha-brigmatine, which functions as a long-term signal. There's also some changes in some green leafy volatiles. And this little predator here, Geochorus palins, comes running up from the soil, comes up and finds the caterpillar, and starts doing this to it. Sticks its beak into the back, sucks out the juices in, and kills the caterpillar. Like that. So it's a really very effective. No, no toxins, no chemistry, nothing like that. Um, and uh, I, there's a couple of other stories where uh, we've been able to find that there are other parts of the plant that do exactly the same thing. Uh, basically, here are some trichomes that the, that the caterpillars use as lollipops when they first uh, start to uh, uh, when they first hatch out of their eggs. They feed on these lollipops. These lollipops give the caterpillars a particular smell, and not only the caterpillar, but also the caterpillar's frass, their poop. Um, that frass falls on the ground, and along comes lizards and ants, and they recognize there's a feeding caterpillar upstairs, and they run upstairs and eat that particular caterpillar. So this lollipop is actually functioning as an evil lollipop because it tags them for predation, okay? Right? Now, layer four has to do with the changing of the source-sink relationships in a plant. A plant normally photosynthesizes carbon and, and assimilates it and makes new leaves out of it. But when those FACs are introduced into, a, into another part of the leaf, on the, um, those FACs change the source-sink relationships. The, caterpillar, the plant is now storing its carbon below ground. It waits for the caterpillars to go through its eating machine stage and becomes a sex machine and goes away. And then the plants reflower. It's sort of the Mahatma Gandhi approach to defense. <laughs> now, the fifth layer is probably the most intriguing of all because it involves solving a problem that is a typical example of a complex ecological situation where a good guy is sharing a genome with a bad guy. The bad guy, of course, is the caterpillar that eats the plant, but the good guy is the mother of the caterpillar, the moth, and the moth happens to be one of the best pollinators for this plant. And uh, this plant attracts that mother, that moth, by producing a scent from its flowers at nighttime, which it opens up at nighttime. And the scent is called benzalacetone. Um, and if it doesn't produce that flower, the, it is basically, uh, that scent, it's basically off the radar of these particular moths. Now, the one thing about nectaring, the, flaw, the moths, of course, come to the nectar, they pollinate the plant, um, and when they nectar, they oviposit. So you drink a little nectar, you lay a little egg. You drink a little nectar, you lay a little egg. And what the plant does when it gets chewed on by lots of caterpillars is that it produces a different type of flower. A flower that instead of opening at night and scenting for that, for that moth, it opens, it stays closed during that first night and only opens in the morning, and then it is attractive to a different type of pollinator who is appearing on the screen right now, a hummingbird. And hummingbirds do not lay caterpillar eggs. They lay hummingbird eggs. So it solves the problem by switching, basically having a different section of rotation altogether. Yeah. Uh, I, I told you that, they sh that this plant shuts down nicotine production. It turns out the reason why it shuts down nicotine production, um, it does it through a little ethylene burst, is because um, uh, we discovered a particular um, a gene in the caterpillar that feeds on it through a process called plant-mediated RNAi, which I want to make a little pitch for. This is the process of taking insect genes and transferring them into the plant, and then um, allowing natural herbivore populations to feed on them, and then it silences those genes in the herbivores that feed on those plants. So it's, it's a trophic level uh, transfer of, of RNAi. It's, con uh, it's completely transient, so um, it, it was uh, allowed by Avis to do this, and it allows to discover a spider, which taught us that the function of that gene in the caterpillar uh, was to transfer nicotine from the midgut, which it normally is pooping all that nicotine out, but it takes a little bit of it and repurposes it, puts it into its hemolymph, and then puffs it out um, when the spider attacks it as a type of defensive halitosis. And I can tell you that this biochemical function of this gene is something that we never would have been able to discover if the, fact, if the spider had not told us about it. We never would have discovered this if we had not been able to combine molecular biology and fieldwork. Um, and this is basically the story of our laboratory, that all of the stuff that we found about these plants are things that you simply can't fish out of the DNA sequences because it requires the interactions that are occurring in natural habitats to see the, for their expression. Everything here was induced by a caterpillar spit, something that we you know, never would have pulled out before. So my argument really is that if we're going to make progress in understanding how nature works, we're going to have to use the best tools that science have to offer, and that is, right now, the manipulation of gene expression by our very sorts of genetic transformation procedures. And I want to argue we don't have much time left. 
you know, we have 7 billion people on the planet, we've hit peak baby, we're going to have 10.2 billion people on the planet, and there's not going to be any habitats left. And if we don't start using these habitats as natural laboratories, we're going to have basically lost the ability to understand much of what our natural history legacy is on this planet, because it's gone. And if you don't understand it, and you don't use it, you lose it. I think that's my main take-home message. All right, so uh, we're now going to have a chance for uh, questions from the committee. Um, and there will be a microphone yes. going around so that this can be uh, recorded. So uh, questions for any of the uh, three speakers. Tim, could you identify yourself? Please? Sure, this is Tim Griffin. Uh, Dr. Goodman, can I just take Oh, I had two questions for him. Oh, okay. he, he had to catch a train. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and ask. Okay. I'll, um, he, he brought up the point about um, the yield increases from GM products being about 5% over a 20 year period, in contrast to about 1% a year from conventional breeding. And my question for him was whether those are additive and just imply that most of the uh, yield improvement is just coming from genetic improvement as a result of conventional breeding. And then a piece of it is directly related to uh, the traits that have been incorporated through GM technology. So that was one question that I had for him. Uh, the other was uh, he had used as an example that uh, I think that a particular uh, corn variety at one point covered a large swath of North Carolina. My question is whether uh, that is still typical within some of the major grain crops or whether uh, the maybe the vulnerability or usefulness of those has to do with the fact that, as he also mentioned, there's a single trait or a single event that's incorporated across a huge array of varieties. So those are the two questions that I have for you. So I guess we'll actually get those questions too and then get those answers back to you. Yeah, as a speaker. So it's important to recognize uh, the world record yields for these crops were all produced back in the 60s. And since then, breeding has been incrementally overcoming specific production hazards that keep a crop from producing its real full yield potential. And most of what's been done in biotechnology is overcoming specific disease and pest pressures. But other than that, of course, uh, as you add more water, uh, new hazards show up. But there's a great paper in Science Magazine uh, that I've quoted a lot. Now I can't remember the author, even though he's a good friend of mine. Now uh, that's a, a uh, one of those uh, senior moments. <laughs> but he gives all the world record yields for these crops, and yield increase is in fact something that is not very well understood. But it is really a matter of overcoming specific production hazards. Yeah. Okay, we're going to be getting to that. For the okay. I had, a, had a, just a point of information. I wanted, I wanted a question for uh, for Major Goodman, who I guess has left. Is it? Who has left? Yeah. But All right. We'll, 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 we'll hand it anyway. to him. Okay. And, and the question was, he suggested that when the IP of various transgenes became public domain, that they would no longer be useful. And I'm not quite sure that I understand the point that he was trying to make. And just for the folks on the webcast, that was committee member uh, Larry Bush. Uh, Neil, Neil, Neil Stewart. Um, so, yeah, it's too bad. I've, I've got another question for uh, <laughs> Professor Goodman. It, 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 that's and that that's was, why he left. Yeah, right. <laughs> Smart. So, anyway, the uh, you no. Know, so he, you know, he, he he said that when you engineered, if, if I heard him correctly, you, you engineered various uh, plants with, with with BT or other transgenes that they died. And so that was I, I was I was hoping to get some examples. The other thing on the on the planting of a single of a single variety in corn or a single transgene, I, I, I don't know whether corn is like soybean, where uh, you know the uh, soybean breeders have basically intercrossed 
uh, various various transgenes into all sorts of varieties. So, yeah, there's a single gene and a single uh, promoter and single construct, but different plant backgrounds. And just to ask, what what what, what the situation is in corn, and and, 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 and how, how how much concern is is there for like a really clone monoculture kind of kind of, kind of a setting? Yeah. Questions. All right. Well, I have one for uh, Ian um, uh, to get back to the, this question of having these uh, natural environments available and being able to go through the regulatory hoops to get these plants out there. Two things. Now, one is how many other laboratory groups are doing similar things. How many do you expect to be doing similar things in the future? And are there any kind of specific changes regulatory-wise that would be assistance to you, since you're talking really about uh, small acreage field trials? Yeah, Fred, that's a, that's a really wonderful question. Um, I would have hoped that after almost 20 years of having this technology that my biologists would have been able to use it um, and uh, use it in a way that would allow them to discover all sorts of traits that have been useful for agriculture. And we wouldn't be in a situation now with simply just two traits being marketed. Um, and I think that the fact that we have only just two traits are exactly due to this particular polarization that's been described in, 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 Goodman, in Cook's talks. Um, now, um, we are unique in the fact that we have, we're probably the only group that has the ability to uh, genetically modify a native plant and do releases in a nature reserve where that native plant exists. However, there are many Arabidopsis biologists who are doing releases. Um, uh, frequently, they're not transgenic releases. They are uh, EMS immunogenized uh, uh, plants, so they don't have to go through the same regulatory hurdles. Um, and sometimes there are reals in the end, like, so they can use forward genetics uh, to get at it. Some are sort of uh, broad-based ecological questions. Um, what type of regulatory changes uh, would be advisable? It would be simply wonderful if Europe would copy what APHIS is doing, regardless of how backward you may think it is. It is still an enormous advance over what um, uh, currently exists, which is stifling. There is simply no possibility of doing uh, releases or having people uh, uh, doing uh, sort of the functional field biology that we do in Europe. Um, so, I mean, just to follow it up, what was the process you had to go through with APHIS and how expensive was that process? And the process has actually been remarkably um, science-driven. Uh, it's been a very long process where we've uh, continued to submit new constructs every year and they get evaluated, of course, every year. We've uh, had a couple of rough spots with them, um, but uh, I think we've worked it out. It usually involves some trips to Washington to explain what we're doing. But basically, we're regulated in, in the normal way, in the sense that um, uh, we can inspect it every year. Uh, we have to uh, ensure that there are no transgenic releases. We survey natural populations. We only conduct certain types of experiments when there are no natural populations within pollen flow uh, uh, distances uh, of the plants. Um, that includes hummingbird vector pollen flow. Pollen flow. Um, so some years we've had to have an 18 kilometer uh, distance uh, uh, barrier between natural populations and other. But the, the, the main process really has been convincing Avis that we understand the natural history of this plant and that by understanding the natural history of this plant we can reasonably with some degree of, of accuracy um, minimize chances for releases. Um, and uh, the, the plants get planted into a plant that we we will monitor for three years, five years after our last one. We, of course, do burns on these plot, plots to, and use those smoke cues to get them to germinate and look for volunteers. Um, so um, it's really a very uh, reasonable scientific dialogue that we have with Avis. Um, and I think we can assure today, after 14 years of doing releases of so many different lines, um, that you can sample any native population out there in our area and you will not find a transgene. But we've still been able to discover all this stuff about this plant, you know. Okay. Other questions from the committee? Well, I have one for Dr. Cook. Um, so there's been at least, oh yeah, I'm like Gallo from Rutgers. Um, there's been several committee reports on, I guess I would call it dichotomies or, or the insurmountable regulatory. But what would be your suggestion 
this committee or to anybody else on how do you get Congress or how do you get the, the political clout to homogenize these things you know, one way or the other. I mean, they do. They're all over the place. Well, I'm not sure how much Congress knows or even that the general public knows about uh, how the regulatory agencies uh, have operated. And uh, let me just say in their defense, uh, whether this technology could have found its way into commercial use without, you know, some of the methods that they use. But uh, I don't know how many of you on this committee were aware that USDA uses the Plant Pest Act for its authority and EPA uses the FEPRA for its authority. Uh, and some, you might say very clever, but at the time these were happening, there was a huge outcry from the scientific community. You've got to be kidding. So to what extent does the public know and how can we move past this? And that's why I'm, I'm suggesting that the new gene and genome editing technologies might give us, you know, a fresh start in terms of moving biotechnology into broader applications. Uh, and I really think that that's, that's where it has to go. I'm not sure that we can change anything with respect to what's been happening with uh, glyphosate resistance and BT, just except more and more of the same. So Rick Dixon, a question for Dr. Baldwin. Um, <coughs> looking at your, what you presented in a totally different light, um, you've probably done more than anybody else to sort of dissect how plants under natural environmental conditions change their chemistry. So from the whole debate about substantial equivalence, I mean, what kind of variability are you seeing in the chemistry of these organisms absent of any transgenes? Uh, Professor Dixon, I think that's, that's an excellent question. This, this is um, a plant because it hides out in the sea bank for so many years and pops up into an environment that it really can't predict what's going to happen to it, has evolved one of the most protein metabolomes that I know of. Now, but that's only because I've studied one plant and it may well be an example of what happens in almost all other wild plants too. So this is a plant that, that, that elicits just for those good factors about 4,000 uh, new metabolic changes in it, new mass spectral changes and there are whole biosynthetic pathways that were sleeping that are activated. Um, this has nothing to do with transgenics, it simply has to do with the fact that plants have to solve ecological problems through chemistry and that they need to have information about what's happening to them to be able to uh, activate and synthesize the appropriate chemical solutions to their to their problems. So thinking that you know metabolomes are constant and are not environmentally dependent is, is simply just not what the facts say. The plants are constantly changing their phenotypes to adjust um, the current situation they're growing in. And it's happening in our crop plants as well. Hi, Mike Rodemeyer, uh, University of Virginia. Um, this, I'd actually like both speakers to address this. Um, there's been a focus in the discussion so far about the burdens of the regulatory system, but there certainly have been a number of crops that have gone successfully through that system in the United States that were either pulled from the market or never commercialized, not because they couldn't afford to get through the system, but because there was a concern about market acceptance. So if you could uh, kind of dissect for me a little bit, what's the... What's the driver here? I mean, I, obviously both of those things are, are an issue, but how much of the, the constraint to the development of products or to the impediment to research is driven by market uh, perceptions rather than regulatory burdens? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I'm gonna use some examples from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, when I mentioned that there are two crops uh, approved uh, for commercial production that deploy BT, uh, in fact, there are three. Uh, potato, uh, the Russet Burbank potato, uh, has been approved for commercialization, uh, both uh, with a BT for Colorado potato beetle, uh, what was then given the trade name by Monsanto of the new leaf, and then a gene called protein mediated resistance to the potato leaf curl, which uh, is a aphid vector virus, which they commercialized under New Leaf Plus. And this genetically engineered potato was in the process of being, uh, had already gone through seed increase and it was being uh, very rapidly adopted and the impact, for one thing you didn't have to spray maybe more than once with an insecticide a year as opposed to several times. Workers could get in and out of the fields 
take their petiole samples for nitrogen, but McDonald's informed uh, the processors that they would not use those potatoes for potato or uh, uh, French fries, and that ended it. And all those potatoes had to be destroyed, and they could not be marketed. So that was a huge impediment right there, and it wasn't the bad guy this time wasn't Monsanto; it was McDonald's. Uh, and but they were in turn concerned about what would happen if they tried to market those uh, French fries in their facilities in Europe. So now there's a couple of other examples. Uh, uh, Bob Martin at Oregon State University with ARS has developed a code protein mediated resistance to a virus disease of raspberry called the, re the bushy stunt of disease, a virus. And it takes out stands of raspberry. The Pacific Northwest and specifically up in northwestern uh, Washington produces about 90% of the nation's red raspberry crop. And then a lot of it is exported to Japan and South Korea. And they will not use, uh, I think Bob could get that uh, through the regulatory process, uh, but he hasn't tried. But even if he did, it would still stay on the shelf because uh, the industry is afraid if they have even one acre of commercial raspberry with that trait added to it, that would then taint the entire industry. And it's the same way that the wheat growers, uh, if there was a single variety of wheat, and we have varieties of wheat, in fact, more than that, there's a variety of barley that has been genetically engineered to be improved in fermentation for beer making. And it sits on the shelf because the industry says, if we go commercial, you can grow these on the experiment station, but you can't grow them commercially. So it's a huge impact right there. And this just complicates the whole thing. I'll just bring one more question back to you folks. Uh, one of our goals is to look at prospects for the future, and certainly Major Goodman was talking about some of the low-hanging fruit that are being collected now, but seemed pessimistic about future in terms of increases in potential yield from transgenics. Could either of you two comment on that same thing? I mean, you commented a little bit, but a little more. With a single transgene, I could get a 20% yield increase in Negotiating Attenuata if anyone ever cared about that. <laughs> and that's simply by disabling that whole signaling system that I had there, and you could take it out with one, um, and that basically shuts down all those very costly things that a plant does, um, and you could then um, you know, express VT in it and get reasonable production, and you'll be able to get a, a plant with a single gene with a 20% increase. This is one that has been selected for very fast growth and high yield production because of its high degree of interspecific competition. So would you expect similar things from crops? So, I, sure. But I don't think people are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the tragedy. That we have not done those sort of experiments. And yet we know so much about how a plant works. We just haven't really had that chance to take it to the field. Do you want to come Well, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, transcription activator-like effector proteins and the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, and I know very little about these uh, technologies other than what I've read in review papers, but uh, the, these technologies are cutting across all areas of biology, from stem cell modification to animal modification to plant modification, microbial modification, and I just see a huge potential there. And, uh, as this committee looks at that kind of technology or post-transcriptional gene silencing, uh, and I just edited a fantastic paper by Claude Fouquet on this for an encyclopedia, and I've cited it in my paper that will be turned in. Uh, there's just all kinds of opportunity there, and it's completely different from the transgene approach that we've been looking at. Insert a gene for a toxicant or insert a gene to replace an enzyme. Uh, but just tweaking the genome. I think this is where, we, if this committee finds that that is in fact, they do not see the production hazard, or the, the environmental or, or safety hazards to go along with that, or that these are not understandable or manageable, I think a very strong recommendation from this committee to move that technology onto the front, front burner as a way to progress. And again, it moves us past this concentration on just two technologies. Uh, herbicide, glyphosate resistance and, and insect control with DT. 
I think we're really due for a uh, break. But before we break, just to tell the three speakers that uh, we've gotten a lot from you. We'll take your papers, but we'll also probably be getting in touch with you with more questions uh, for references and other details. So we'll reconvene at uh, 3 o'clock. All right, thank you.